Amen. God bless you. Bless you. Well, our offering text, I believe, will make sense for us hearing the testimonies that we've heard. He who gives to the poor will lack nothing, but he who closes his eyes to them receives many curses. God's blessed us. I can share with you this week that while I was away, I got a, a message that um, someone wanted to donate a basketball court to us. And when I say a basketball court, I'm talking about nearly a full length basketball court that was rubberized brick with two hoops, fence go all the way around it, that could literally fit in a gymnasium. And they wanted to give it to us here at Meridian because of the work we do in the community. And I knew we didn't have a place to put it, so I said, can I, can I call you back in 24 hours with an answer? We'll take it, but we're not going to take it for us. We'll take it. So I got off the phone with that gentleman, and I called another church who I was talking to their pastor. His pastor was a friend of mine. Um, in fact, the church where Pastor Sean is now on staff is the outreach pastor and uh, connections pastor, and I think he does small groups as well. But anyway, I was talking to the pastor of their, their one of their campuses, and I said, hey, would you guys be interested in this basketball court? And he said, well, part of our vision, of course, it's New Vision Church, is the name of the church, because part of our vision is to have a basketball court where kids could come and play basketball. And I said, well, I, I have a connection to give you a basketball court, and you know, they just need an address as to where to deliver it. It's on a trailer. It's all ready to go. And I will send you a picture. So I sent him a picture. And he called me back and said, yeah, we'll take it. He says, I'll tell our pastor. I'm sure it's going to be okay. And I said, okay, we'll talk to your pastor first and then let me know. Long story short, made the connection and it's going to be delivered to that church, be unpacked and, and set up. They'll figure out all of that. And I said, just, Lord, thank you so much for the, for the opportunity to be a vessel of blessing to someone else. And, and amazing. Well, then on Thursday, when we're in the office, uh, Jeanette comes into my office and she says, Pastor, there's a gentleman here that wants to give the church some chairs. And I said, well, you know, we've already, we just purchased some chairs. And, we, and he says, well, he said he wants to give them to you and he wants you to come out and talk to him. So I came out of the office and went down to the end of the 300 building. And there this gentleman was who, he had a truckload of chairs. He had 15 chairs, similar to the chairs that you're sitting in right now. Two different colors. And he says, not all of them are good, but some of them are, are good, and I'd like to give them to the church. Rather than, he says, my task is to throw them away. He says, but I, I see that some of them are good. I said, okay. And uh, I said, well, how'd you hear about us? He says, well, I just want you to know, my family comes and on Thursdays and we get food here. Amen. So I thought about this church when I was given these chairs and given the assignment to throw them away. And I said, okay, we'll take them. And then I thought, what are we going to do with these chairs? <laughs> Asked Jay and uh, Jay Yarmy and his friend. I can't call his name right now. Jerry. Jerry. I, 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 yeah, I was going to say something different, but Jerry. <laughs> And I uh, asked Jerry, asked Jay to get in touch with Jerry to see if Jerry would come and clean the chairs. Long story short, our children's ministry has some new chairs in their, in their building. Nice, comfortable chairs that us adults get to sit in. Amen? And the old chairs that were ratted and tearing up and stuff, we'll dispose of. God, isn't that God good? Just allow him to, to bless us as we give. He knows what we're doing, and He blesses us. Sister Doris? Amen. 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 God bless you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Lord, we come to you this morning praising you for the opportunity we have to give. In these envelopes that are in our hands, we hold a portion of what you have blessed us with. We know, Lord, that everything we have is yours and how blessed we are to be stewards of your resources, to be conduits of blessings, to not only to give, but to receive from your generosity. Lord, we thank you for your gifts to us. Thank you for the testimonies that we've heard this morning. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless us. As your word tells us that the one who gives to the poor will lack nothing. And Lord, that isn't just poor financially, but poor in spirit. And so Lord, as we give, we thank you for the fact that we can give to those who don't have what we have. You've blessed us bountifully. Lord Jesus, you've blessed us with salvation. So we thank you this morning. We give you praise and we pray again that you would open up a window in heaven and pour out a blessing that we know has truly come from you. We pray, God, that as a part of this network of churches throughout the United States, that we thank you that we can cooperate for the upbuilding of your kingdom, not only here in El Cajon, San Diego, California, United States, but throughout the world. And how you have, Lord, allowed us to participate in placing missionaries around the world to share the gospel, some who are literally in harm's way. We pray that you would bless them in a mighty way and protect them, God. And Lord, we'll be ever careful to give you the praise and the glory. For it's in your mighty and precious name, Jesus, we pray with joy, thanksgiving, and forgiveness of sin. Amen. Well, I enjoy listening to the testimonies that you guys have. That we all should be eager at the bit to jump up and share with the blessings of God in terms of giving. Because we are only stewards of what he's already given us. You know what I mean? So, the intercessory prayer text comes out of Psalms 48, verses 4 to 7. The word of the Lord reads, When the kings joined forces, when they advanced together, they saw her and were astounded. They fled in terror. Trembling seized them there. Pain like that of a woman in birth, excuse me, in labor. You destroyed them like ships of Tarshish, shattered by an east wind. The Lord had a blessing to the reading, hearing of his word. The emphasis is on power. Today's intercessory prayer time. And as the band was singing and brought up some wonderful words for us to engage with them in song, what a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. So you got a problem, what's the answer? You got an issue, what's the answer? So we have the power of Jesus in us through his Holy Spirit. So regardless of where we might consider ourselves, Regardless of how life might have introduced itself to us, we got Jesus. Amen. We got Jesus. Amen. We got hope and we got power. We got the Holy Spirit indwelt within us. So I want to offer to you, maybe a couple of you, there is no box that God fits in. He is beyond the box. Amen. He is beyond what information you might receive in the mail. He is beyond whatever condition or circumstance you might be going through. He is outside the box and that's where he reigns. He's outside the box and he reigns covering you and me 
so that nothing comes to us that he hasn't already filtered. Think about that. Now you have to be his child. He just don't freely give it. But he is God. And he's outside that box. So when we start thinking about power, just think Jesus. You need hope? Think Jesus. I'm not a preacher, but I feel like it. Think Jesus. That's nothing asking you, Pastor. I'm not putting it out there to preach. I'm just saying. I can sit in the pew and be fine. But just think Jesus, no matter what. Think Jesus. Amen? Word. Word. So, this morning, before we introduce our inter intercessory prayer, I want us, as usual, to clear our minds. Consider the issue you might be dealing with. And let's go to Jesus who is the answer for it all. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you, Father, not only for those who are here, but those who might be listening in the parking lot and or via the technology that we have. We lift up each and every home to you this morning. We may not be aware of the intricate details of the issues and concerns of a home, Father, but if it's anything like mine, Lord, we need you. There's no way around it. We need you. You are the only one who can come forward, and we thank you that you've given us the ability to come to your throne of grace and mercy unashamedly and with boldness because we are expecting you to come through for us, not as a genie, but to come through to provide glory to your own name, Father. Our situation sometimes might even appear to be hopeless, but that's where we have hope in you. That is where you reign, Father. In what man considers hopeless, you consider trivial. And we thank you for that. <clears throat> We thank you that we have the power to move in those directions, Father. We lift up several different families to you. And as I have said before, many of these families are grieving. But Father, I do believe and know that you never stop grieving when you lost a loved one. You move from one facet to another, or you move from one condition to another, but you still grieve. You still have pain. And we know that that grief, that void, is only satisfied by you. So Father, we lift up every family that has lost a loved one, both in the building and out, that they might be ministered to by you. We lift up Mother Diaz to you, Father, and her situation. We lift up, in fact, the entire Diaz family. We pray, Father, for them. And we pray, Father, for healing and comfort. We lift up Sister Hazel to you, Brother Richard. We lift up Sister Jolene, and Issa, and Abby to you, Father, just to name a few. But there are so many others that we could call out a name, Father, but we know that, Lord, you know what families we have with health issues and what families we have that need your touch. I pray, Father, for our condition, for our circumstance, and anything that might cause us to lose joy. Because our joy is in you, and by that we mean our joy is unspeakable and full of glory, as the songster writes. But Father, thank you for making it so that we can come before you. We thank you, Father, that no matter what issues we may be having, we can lift them and bring them to your feet and leave them there. 
Letting God be God is what we need to do. And we really need to get ourselves out of it, get away from trying to act like we have control because we do not. So forgive us. Fill our hearts with your love, Father. Fill our hearts with your power. In spite of our weakness, Lord, help us to love our enemies. And the most difficult thing, help us to pray for those who persecute us. So, Father, we lift up your manservant this morning. We pray, Father, for preaching power, if that's something that I can say before you, but you know exactly what I mean. We pray, Lord, that he speaks unashamedly and unapologetically to these, your people, both in this building and via technology. And Father, we ask that you to continue to help us to encourage him as he leads this group of people. All for your glory, Father. Not for humane or human uh, accomplishments or anything like that, but it's all for your glory. So bless us, help us, hold us, keep us, and let us realize that you are not in the box. There is no box that could surround you. So help us to put that in our hearts, minds, and help us to respond and act on it. Holy Spirit, have your way in this continued worship. We ask these things in the powerful name of Jesus, who is the answer to it all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Gary. Thank you, those of you who shared a testimony. Yes. Love what Sister Doris said. You can't beat God given. You can't outgive God. No matter what you do. We're blessed. Well, since we last met and gathered here to worship. I was blessed to go back to Nashville and then to get home. And I'm thankful because I got home at 8 o'clock at night rather than midnight, which was the original time I was supposed to get home. They changed my flight and allowed me to come. And, but I went to the, went back for the um, Southern Baptist Convention Prayer Leaders Summit. 47 of us got together on the seventh floor in the Learning Center there in Nashville and talked about what it would be like if we had a movement of God across the 50,000 churches that make up the Southern Baptist Convention. That if truly all of our churches were houses of prayer, what would it be like? And we went back through the history the movements of prayer and awakening. And uh, there'll be more coming out in the next few months. But I just want to say thank you for allowing me to go. It was a quick trip. I left Tuesday and came home Wednesday. Um, and had two meetings in between. So, But God is so good. This morning I want to share with you a message entitled Open My Eyes. It's from Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. And specifically, it, it talks about, these verses talk about the healing of Bartimaeus. This particular miracle is the last healing miracle found in the Gospel of Mark. It's also recorded in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Luke. Matthew and Luke don't mention his name, but Mark does. 
And when you read the three accounts, there are some, there are some differences, and, and the differences are not, um, don't make it another event. It is of the same event, but it's just told, understanding that, we have to understand that Matthew was an eyewitness, Mark and Luke were not. And so there is some, some difference of where it is, and there's the difference in new, old Jericho and new Jericho, and, and the, the place where, the, where it was two beggars or one. We know that there was a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. And that's what we want to concentrate on this morning. So reading from Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 46, and concluding at verse 52, it reads thusly. Then they came to Jericho, as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David! Have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you again for the privilege of today. May, Lord, the words that we speak be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Lord, I stand in obedience to the call that you have placed upon my life, and I ask you once again to use me as your instrument. Allow me, Lord Jesus, to decrease and you increase. Think with my mind and speak with my voice. And Lord, I'll be ever careful to give you the praise and glory. For it's in your mighty and precious name, Jesus, I pray. With joy, thanksgiving, and forgiveness of sin. Amen. Amen. Well, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus encounters this blind man. Now, I need to just let you know, just for background... It's about a week before Passion Week. When Jesus is on his way, and as he's going from Jericho to Jerusalem, he encounters this blind man. And the blind man receives his sight by believing that Jesus is the Messiah. Unlike the generation of people he's about to meet in Jerusalem. And this morning, I just want to share with you four quick points, and we'll go on to the Lord's Supper. The first is the request. The second is the response. The third is the restoration. And by now, you know I've alliterated. The fourth one is the reaction. The request, the response, the restoration, and the reaction. The request is specifically by Bartimaeus. Who is he? As I said, in Mark's account, he names him. He is the son of Timaeus. And as much as we know about him, we don't know a lot from here in God's word but I can, I can refer you to the Apocrypha, the historical record following this, and you will find a, stories of Bartimaeus and who he is. It's important that we know his name 
Because the name in the Jewish tradition means something. And not only do we know his name, but we know his father's name. And, and I can tell you that if you do the research, you'll find that, that he became a prominent disciple. But he was known by Jesus. And he, he, so we know who he is and we know what he wants. He cries out to Jesus to have mercy on him. And I want you to know that there's no mistake in what Jesus' response in the miracles that we've been preaching through. You'll notice that Jesus asks the person what it is they want. Now he knows, he, he's, he, he knows everything. He knows what their need is, but he's really, it's, a, it's an exchange in testing or understanding their faith and giving them an opportunity to express their faith, if you will. Jesus doesn't need to know. He knows the answer to the question before he even speaks the question. He knows what their need is. So don't discount the exchange between Jesus and Bartimaeus. But this crowd is around them. And knowing that Jesus has now, he's healed and, and he's on his way. And so there's, a, there's quite an entourage, if you will. And look at the, the, the response from the crowd. Verse 48 says that many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. I think it's uh, the crowd rebuked him is what Matthew says as well. And told him to be quiet. Luke says the same thing, that those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. In other words, politely saying, they told him, shut up, man. Jesus is on the way, and he's coming by, and you need to be quiet. You need to be reverent, if you will. They, they, and, and don't bother him. Don't bother who he is, but look at what happens. He shouts even louder. And what he shouts is, he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He calls him by royalty, being the son of David. Understand that this community knows about King David. They know their Old Testament. And so he's calling Jesus out for who he is. He's the son of David. Well, first they're telling him, shut up. And then it goes on to say that as he got louder and calls him son of David, have mercy on me again. And then in verse 49, it says, Jesus stopped. All of these people are on their way to Jerusalem. They stop. And the crowd that had re been rebuking this man suddenly say to him, Cheer up! On your feet! He's calling you! In other words, they've gone from rebuking him and telling him to shut up and saying, man, come on, get up! And you can imagine, they're saying, we'll go with you! We'll get close to Jesus! We'll seize this opportunity and go with you! You know, it's kind of, when I thought about this, you know, in sports, some of us have our favorite teams. And we cheer for our teams in good times and in bad. But then there's a group of people that when you're, their team that you're cheering for wins the Super Bowl or wins the World Series, all of a sudden they become fans of that team. And we call those what? Bandwagon fans. The crowd has now jumped on Bartimaeus' bandwagon. They want to be part of, they want to cheer him on. They said, cheer up, brother, come on. He's calling you. But just a few moments ago, they were telling him, shut up. But I also want you to notice something that interesting happens in the, in the response is, that happens here in this verse or in these verses in verse 50 it says that Bartimaeus is there and he 
throwing off his cloak or throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Now, some will tell you that throwing off his cloak doesn't really mean anything. That it's no big deal. But I, I, I want to remind us that, well, not, I, I, I was reminded when I was studying this. Let me just go back and put it on me. I don't want to, maybe it was just for me. But I just want to share an insight that came to me while I was studying. I was reminded of Hebrews 12.1. Which is therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So I, I don't think that we can just cast off the fact that Bartimaeus, when he's cheered on, when he's encouraged to get to his feet and to go to Jesus, he throws off his cloak. And he comes to Jesus. And then he has a conversation with Jesus. Jesus asked him, what did you, what do you want me to do? And Bartimaeus, again, his, his response, don't, don't just overlook his response. He says, Rabbi, in other words, teacher, I want to see. And then Jesus' response is so simple. Go. Your faith has healed you. Amen. And then the text says, verse 52, immediately he received his sight. As soon as Jesus said, go, your faith has healed you, his vision became 2020. It wasn't gradual. He, it's not like the previous time when we, he's... he's when Jesus healed the blind man and they saw trees that looked like, or they saw men that looked like trees. And then they got touched again and their vision cleared up completely. Bartimaeus' vision became clear immediately. So the restoration is there, but let me just share with you the reaction. The reaction from Bartimaeus and let me just point out to you a word that we often overlook. There at the end of verse 52, it says, Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Bartimaeus drops everything and follows Jesus. That's an, an example of discipleship 101. He meets the Lord, the Lord heals him, and immediately he starts following. Now, let me just, let me share with you, Bartimaeus' life has changed dramatically. See, Bartimaeus was being blind, he sat by the side of the road. And he begged, that was his way of making money, that was his way of surviving, that was his job. But now when he's asked Jesus to give him sight and his sight is restored immediately, that's all going to change. He can't beg no more. He's going to have to get up and he's going to have to do something. And what he does is he gets up and he follows Jesus. He leaves everything behind. So not only has his life changed physically, but it's changed emotionally. Because here he was, he was literally, he was, well, for lack of a better term, he was being bullied by the crowd. But yet he stood his ground and he's even shouted louder. He had confidence, not in the crowd, but he had confidence in Jesus. And so he was willing to shout even louder and Jesus heard him. And stopped the crowd. So not only was he changed physically and emotionally, and I believe psychologically, and I believe he's impacted financially but most important, he's changed spiritually. Really, little needs to be said about the lesson from this miracle, which is simply this. There's a, we need to be ready and then act in power. When we talk about prayer, 
One of the things that I learned in, this, in the time at the summit of prayer leaders is that we, we pray in power and then believe the prayer. We believe that God's going to bless, believe that God's going to answer that prayer. We don't pray saying, well, if you think so. No, we pray in power. There's a readiness. When we go to God in prayer, that's our readiness. We're saying, God, we need your help. And then we need to get up off our knees and say, we know God's going to help us. And now we're going to walk in a way that that defies logic. We're going to walk in the power of God, the power of our risen Savior. That's how we're going to walk. We're not going to walk as cowards. We're not going to walk as people who are ashamed. But we're going to walk in power, believing that God is going to answer. The effect of blindness in a man reveals itself in many ways. In 1 John 2.11, it reminds us that it reveals it in not seeing where he's going. So, but, whatever, but whoever hates his brother and is in the darkness walks around in the darkness and he does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. We live in a world where people are walking around literally in darkness. They're around us and their eyes are open, but they're in darkness. It manifests its way, or reveals itself in, in people's lives and, and getting in the way of others and, and leading others in a wrong way. Jesus said himself in a parable in Luke 6, he says, can a blind man lead a blind man? He asks that question, and then he answers it. Will they both not fall in a pit? You've heard the phrase, the blind leading the blind. And we all, we hear that and we say, blind leading the blind, they're not going anywhere. Well, if they go anywhere, it's going to be painful, it's going to hurt. But also... It manifests themselves in its, itself in that they're not able to see the beauty of light because they're walking in darkness. Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I believe Bartimaeus, the reason he's, he can get up off the side of the road and walk with Jesus and follow is because now he's got the light of life in him. He's walking. He doesn't know what's going to happen, but he knows who now has given him eyes to see. And we even sang that this morning. And just as a parenthetical note, let me just throw in for just a moment. I don't know if you ever really concentrated or even observed the songs that our worship team makes sure that we sing. We sing songs, hear me clearly, we sing songs that are based on on, that they select based on worshiping him, not ourselves. Amen. The songs we sing in praise and worship, this is just a parenthetical note, it's not today's sermon. But we, we, we sing songs that glorify God, that draw us close to him, that's not about us and our stuff, it's about him. Amen. They lead us in praise and worship. I'm sorry, I, I just had to say that. In case you missed it, when we sang today, I, I heard it. Open our eyes. And then lastly, in knowing the glory, a person walking in, the, in blindness doesn't know the glorious things that are above and around them. Do you remember in, in 2 Kings? When the servant was wondering why Elisha could be so calm. And Elisha then, it says in, in 2 Kings chapter 6, he prays, he says, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the, the servant's eyes and he looked and the hills were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. He wasn't scared. He wasn't alone. Because he knew he was walking in the power 
in the light. He saw things. And I believe that Bartimaeus is seeing things now. And he's seeing a whole new world around him. He doesn't care about how he's going to make an income. He's going to follow Jesus. And here's the, here's the beauty of this. The beauty of this, this text is Bartimaeus, he knew what begging was. He knew how to beg. He was a professional beggar. And in this case, he applied, he applied his skill to his greatest need. Bartimaeus made the choice between his greatest need and worldly satisfaction. He said, I want to see. I'm willing to throw off not only the cloak, but I'm willing to throw off everything that's holding me back and follow you with all that I am. And when people are willing to humble themselves and plead for mercy, they will find it. Amen. And their eyes will be made to see that Jesus is the Messiah. Amen. That Jesus is the Deliverer. That Jesus is the Savior of the world. But they've got to have open eyes. We've got to get to that place in our own lives and, and say, or they have got to get to that place in their own lives and say, open my eyes, Lord, so that I can see. See what you see. And for those of us who are believers, our vision shouldn't be dim. We should see the world the way he sees the world. Willing to lay down our opinions and our preferences for the glory of God. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the privilege again of today. The privilege of the opportunity that is before us to admit where we are. To believe, Lord Jesus, that you came, that you died, and confess you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray you would literally lift us up. Reassure us that you are with us, God. Lord, we don't need a, we're not asking for a miraculous sign. We're just asking God for a change in our hearts. A change that would make our eyes see the world the way you see it. Lord, you saw us, as the old song says, sinking deep in sin. You came from heaven to earth. You died, Lord. You gave your life on that old rugged cross on Calvary's Hill. And Lord, we are so thankful that that's not the end of the story. But you got up on that third day with all power in your hand. And even after that, you walked amongst your disciples, amongst the people, showing them that you had fulfilled everything that you promised that you would do. Even, Lord, appearing to doubtful Thomas. Letting him see your nail-pierced hands. Lord, today, I pray in this place that if there be one who's never invited you to come into their life, I pray today that they would they would simply say Lord Jesus I'm a lost sinner but I consciously and sincerely invite you into my life save me and be my Lord Father I thank you again for touching our lives those of us who know you and have been baptized Lord I pray that we'll follow the example of Bartimaeus that, Lord, we'll follow along the road. Thank you for the cloud of witnesses that surrounds us. That the memory of them encourages our hearts that we are not alone. Pray that we'd walk in the power that you have given us. For it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. With joy, thanksgiving, and forgiveness of sin. Let's stand together.
Let's pray for our elements. Lord, we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper. We come to you in prayer, asking, Father, that you would bless these elements. Bread, fruit of the vine. Lord Jesus, we know they are symbolic of your broken body and your shed blood. We're also mindful, Lord, that your word tells us that we ought to confess our sins. So as not to bring judgment upon ourselves before we partake of the Lord's Supper. And your word also admonishes us that if we have ought against a brother or sister, that we literally should leave the table and go be reconciled to them before partaking of the Lord's Supper. Lord, I pray that there, if there be any disagreements or dis, discords between us, that not only would, we, would it be revealed, but I pray that we would literally, if necessary, get up and go and be reconciled to our brother and sister. Thank you for the privilege again of today. As we prepare our hearts, we ask for your forgiveness. It's in Jesus' name I pray. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me.